Hey YouTube, how's it going? Yak Science here with another OCHEM video. Uh, last video, uh, we talked about the concepts behind SN2 reactions, uh, properties of SN2 reactions, how they differ from other reactions, but I figured it would be good, it would be beneficial to just work through some examples that you might see on tests and uh, some of the tricks that teachers can throw at you uh, when it comes to SN2 reactions, okay? So let's just go ahead and get started. I have some examples prepared right here. So let's start, uh, let me erase this so it not out of the way so it doesn't get in the way. Okay, so let's say we have this molecule right here. Okay, and we react it with and by the way I encourage you to pause the video um, I'm just gonna go through and solve it but I encourage you to pause the video try to do this on your own maybe on a separate piece of paper um, and see how you do, okay? So pause the video now if you wanna try it on your own. If not, I'm gonna go right into solving it, okay? So, Na we know is positively charged ion, OCH3, oxygen with one bond, negative formal charge, okay? So what's gonna happen is this, identify the electrophile, step one, right here, right? This carbon is electrophilic. So, we have OCH3, negative formal charge. We're gonna attack the electrophilic carbon just like that, kick off the leaving group, and what becomes is this. Okay, we made um, an ether. Okay, so that's that. Hope that wasn't too bad. Uh, that's a pretty simple one, right? You have a good leaving group, you have a good nucleophile, boom, they replace each other. Uh, let's keep going. Another example here. It's going to look similar, but it's actually a pretty different problem. We'll see why in a sec, okay? So you might be inclined right away to say, oh, NaOH in water, right, really strong nucleophile. All I have to do is attack this electrophilic carbon, kick out the leaving group, and uh, form something like this, right? So my guess is some of you got that as an answer. The problem is this will never happen, okay? And here's why. This carbon is tertiary. This electrophilic carbon is attached to one, two, three other carbons. And we learned in the last video, tertiary carbons never undergo SN2. They can undergo other reactions. We'll learn about those later. But SN2, you, you need either a primary or a secondary carbon. Okay, let's keep going. I keep using bromine, sorry about that. It's just a really easy molecule to use. We're gonna react this with excess LiSCH3. Hope you can see that. LiSCH3. I'll, I'll make that bigger right here. Okay. Li positive ion SCH3. S just like oxygen with one bond has a negative formal charge. So what's gonna happen is this. Right? Identify the electrophilic carbon. There are two, but notice we have excess. So that's good. That means we can attack both, right? One, one unit of LiSCH3 will attack this, send those electrons to bromine. Another unit, we could draw that up here. We'll attack this electrophilic carbon. And your product will look something like this. One, two, three, four carbons. One, two, three, four carbons. And there you go. Make sure that's an important point that I just thought of. Um, make sure to count your carbons on tests. That's a really easy way to get points docked off. If you need to, number your carbons, right? And make sure that in your answer you have the same number of carbons that you started with. Um, of course, you'll have two more carbons because the SCH3 has a carbon in it, but you know what I mean. You have to count the skeleton, make sure the skeleton stays the same. Sorry. Okay. 
So what do you guys think will happen here? Uh, you might be inclined to have this I minus attack this electrophilic carbon and send this off. What's the problem with that? OH is a very bad leaving group, right? It, it is so happy. Oxygen with two bonds is golden. It's like in heaven, right? Organic chemistry in heaven. It does not want to leave. OH minus is extremely unstable on its own. We know that because it's a super strong base. Um, very, very unstable. So the chances of uh, iodine coming in, attacking this carbon, and kicking out OH, it's, it's zero to close to none. Okay, so this will not happen. No SN2 reaction. Because okay. SN2, not only do you need a strong nucleophile, you need a good leaving group. Here we go, let's get to another problem. Okay, now we're gonna take into account some stereochemistry because that's a really important part of, uh, of SN2 reactions, okay? We're gonna react this with NaOH in water. Okay. So what's gonna happen? We have our OH minus. It's gonna come in and attack the electrophilic carbon. Where's the electrophilic carbon? It's right here. It's attached to a good leaving group, right? So it's gonna come in, attack, and these electrons will go to the iodine. Now the question is, what can we say about the stereochemistry of the product? Is this gonna change? No, this stereochemistry is gonna stay the same because it's not part of the attack. The attack site only is the part that's inverted for SN2 reactions. So our product will look something like this. The skeleton stays the same, right? Our methyl group over here is still going to be dashed, just like before. But now, our hydroxyl group <clears throat> is going to be dashed as well, right? Because wedge becomes dash, dash becomes wedge in most cases. Uh, so here we go. OH. That's, uh, that's the answer. Okay? So hope, hope that wasn't too tricky for you. Just know that in SN2, stereochemistry is inverted. Now here, here's a common trick uh, that teachers will often put uh, on exams. Okay, I want to do the same problem, but change it up a bit. And this, this is something that you should definitely be aware of going into a test. We're going to do the exact same problem. This time, I want to change one thing. I want to change the solvent. Remember last time we talked a lot about the solvent and how it affects nucleophilicity? If you haven't watched that video, I, su I highly suggest it. Let's put it in NaOH just like before, but the solvent, instead of being water, we're gonna make it methanol, CH3OH. Now, how does this change things? We know that there is a lot more solvent than there is reactant. And in chemistry, right, reactions are just due to random collisions. So NaOH is more likely to collide with solvent than it is to collide with reactant. So what does that mean? When, when the you know, what you're reacting, you're reacting with, can react with the solvent, it will. It'll react with the solvent before reacting with this. So the game plan, right, the game plan, so to speak, is this. NaOH will attack CH3OH. CH3OH will become a, gr a good nucleophile to attack the electrophilic carbon. Here's what that looks like. So we have an OH minus in solution, right? What can it do to the CH3OH? It could deprotonate this, this hydrogen. Okay, that's exactly what happens. It'll take that hydrogen, send these electrons over to oxygen, and now your teachers could also dock points for this. You want double arrows. Why do you want double arrows? Because this is acid-based chemistry. Anytime you're deprotonating things, protonating things, that's acid-based chemistry, exists in equilibrium. So now we created a good nucleophile. We have OCH3 minus. So we still have this product right here. I'm going to redraw it. So we still have that product. But now we have OCH, OCH3 in solution. This has a minus charge. It'll attack the electrophilic carbon. Send those electrons over. And once again, stereochemistry is inverted. Let's go all the way back up here. So now we have... Uh, our skeleton, redraw it. We have an OCH3, okay? And here we have a dashed methyl, okay? 
Okay. So in both cases, the stereochemistry was inverted in this example and the previous. The only difference is the solvent interacted uh, with one of the reactants, one of our reagents, NaOH. So that's something to really look out for. Always think to yourself before you start a problem, what can interact with what? If it can interact with the solvent, it will, because there's a lot more solvent than a reagent. Uh, another trick that teachers could, uh, could give you. Let's react this with some methanol. What do you get? What's the product? The answer is no SN2 product. You will get an SN1 product. That's going to be a future, uh, a future video. But for now, we're talking about SN2, and there's no SN2 product here. Why? The nucleophile is weak. This is a very weak nucleophile. Um, and if, yeah, it's, it's just not going to attack. You need a strong nucleophile. This is one of my favorite ones. So get ready and brace yourself. Okay, here we go. So let's, in, let's react that with NaOH, and here's what our solvent looks like. It's going to look like this. Okay. Interesting solvent. So ask yourself the question again, can the reagent interact with the solvent? The answer is yes. We have an acidic hydrogen right here that could be deprotonated. And since there's more solvent than reagent, it's going to interact with the solvent. So what's the first step? First step is NaOH is going to deprotonate this hydrogen. So we have OH minus, we have this guy, right? I'm going to deprotonate that. Let me, uh, let me draw the OH bond for you to show the movement of electrons. Okay, it's going to deprotonate that hydrogen. These electrons in the sigma bond will go to the oxygen. Double arrows, right? Because it's acid-base chemistry. We end up with, still we have this. And now we have a new nucleophile, a good nucleophile, right? Because it's a full negative charge because this hydrogen was deprotonated. Now this nucleophile can attack our reagent at the electrophilic site. And finally, what we end up with, remember inversion of stereochemistry, we'll end up with something like this. dashed lines instead of wedge, right? Sorry, just like that. Carbon count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Perfect, we're good. Inverted stereochemistry, awesome. We're golden, we're good to go. Um, this is sort of a two-part thing. The question is, um, which happens fastest? This is a very typical question. Uh, you could encounter this on tests. Uh, very likely you will. So I'm going to lay out three reactions. I want you to tell me which one happens fastest, the second fastest, and the slowest. Okay? Okay. So the first thing you, you're probably thinking is, wow, okay, all three of these are the same. Um, but the only thing that's changing is the nucleophile, right? And even the, the solvent is the same in all of these. It's water. Water is a polar protic solvent. Now remember what we said, if you haven't watched the nucleophiles and electrophiles video, I suggest that because that really applies a lot here, how the solvent affects nucleophilicity. So in a polar protic solvent, you want bigger atoms because uh, the polar protic solvent uh, will form a hydration shell around the charged uh, ion. So F is a very, very, very small atom. Uh, uh, Br is a very big atom compared to that, and Cl is also much bigger than F. So we would expect the nucleophilicity of F to be very hindered by H2O. This will be less hindered by H2O, and this will be much less hindered by H2O. So the answer is, this is the fastest, then this one, and then this one. This is the slowest. Why? Because the nucleophilicity of this one is hindered the most due to size. Okay? I could leave that up there. Now let's look at the opposite situation. Um, okay, so you're probably, you're probably ahead of the game here, you noticed, oops, you probably noticed uh, that it's very similar, only I changed the solvent again. 
what I did is I made it a polar aprotic solvent. Acetone, right? If you look at the structure of the acetone, looks like this, right? It's polar, but it's aprotic. No protic hydrogens. So how does that change things? It actually makes the complete opposite trend. Now, basicity is what you have to consider. F is a much, much, much better base than Cl, which is much, much better than Br. So in this case, this will go the fastest, followed by this one, and then this one. The trend is reversed. Okay. And remember, uh, in the nucleophiles and electrophiles video, uh, I talked about other factors that affect nu uh, nucleophilicity. Those could also come in the form of this question, right? They can give you groups that are bulkier versus not bulky, and remember the, the, the less bulky it is, the better, uh, the better the nucleophile. They can give you things with and without resonance, or with a lot of resonance and a little resonance, and the, the nucleophile with less resonance would be fastest. Okay, so that's uh, worked examples with SN2. Uh, I really hope that was helpful, uh, and thanks for watching.